All right, guys, let's talk about enteral and parenteral nutrition. So let's first talk about enteral feedings or enteral nutrition. So who gets enteral feeding? And I'll start off by saying first that this is where we feed people through a feeding tube, either, you know, something in their upper, extra, um, upper, you know, body, you know, that's a temporary tube or something that's in their, um, you know, abdomen, that's maybe more of a permanent tube to feed them to bypass. Usually you're trying to bypass this area. Usually there's a problem somewhere in here that's not allowing people to swallow or eat the way that they're need to. So, um, you know, who gets it? Um, people get enteral feeds if they have eating disorders. So even maybe if someone is able to eat, they don't have a problem here, but they're just not getting the nutrition they need, we may supplement with enteral feeds. Um, people that have fractures or cancer of their head or neck or face, um, neurological or psychiatric conditions, like people maybe have a traumatic brain injury or other things that don't allow them to be awake enough to eat the way they need to, burns or critical illness. So people that are not awake enough or maybe have a burn of their airway of their face, they cannot take in the oral intake or again, not meeting their needs needs like decreased oral intake as a whole. So I'm going to need a feeding bottle and whatever food like um, prescription or whatever, like the type of food that's given, that's going to be chosen by the doctor or nutritionist. We're going to get tubing. Um, we're going to do a pump or syringe and um, we call it um, to um, give the food and then they need to have some sort of tube to actually get it inside their body. So let's talk about those tubes. There's temporary tubes, like I mentioned. So if this is not going to be a long-term thing, but maybe short-term after surgery or something like that, they may have a nasogastric tube in their nose, an orogastric tube in their mouth, a nasoduodenal, which goes in the nose um, and goes all the way in past the stomach into the, to the duodenum. And that's, you know, given to help prevent aspiration. Um, and all of these tubes are going to have markings to verify placement. So every shift I should come in and when I get report, my nurse should tell me, hey, this is where, um, uh, what do you call it, um, your tube is going to be, um, this is where your tube's at. And I'm going to go in and check when I do my assessment to make sure that tube hasn't moved. And then when they first get the tube in, this is not every shift or anything like that. When they first get the tube in, I'm also going to verify it with an x-ray, which is known as a KUB, which is kidneys, ureter, bladder. It's just an x-ray of just my middle portion of my body or my abdomen. Uh, there's also permanent tubes. So those are PEG or G tubes. Those are in the stomach. And there's also what's known as a J tube, which is a tube that's in the jejunum, um, which obviously bypasses some of the small intestines and in, um, uh, the stomach. Um, they, I want to, the big concern for permanent tubes, and this is true, temporary tubes can have skin issues too. I need to watch the skin around the nose or the mouth, but um, it's more concerning for permanent tubes on the abdomen. So I always need to check the skin around these tubes and also monitor for dislodgement. So those if patients are confused and stuff like that, not completely with it, they can pull at those. So what are possible complications of enteral nutrition? Um, they can have diarrhea. So I need to check the expiration on the bottle and make sure that, um, that um, I also change it out. We change out those bottles every 24 hours if they're on continuous feeds or if I'm giving a bolus feed, I wanna make sure that it um, is not expired. They can also have constipation depending on the formula. Um, and so I'm gonna increase their free water. In other words, I'm gonna give them more um, water in between if the, the doctor has to order that by the way. Um, but the, um, that's one thing that can be added is more water in between to kind of thin things out. Think of it like increasing your fluid intake. Like if you were constipated, if you increase your fluids, it helps. And then sometimes the people just don't react well to certain formulas. So we can also change the formula. They can have hyperglycemia. So usually for patients with enteral nutrition, I'm going to give them uh, do a Q six hour blood glucose. And then because of these, this formula has to stay preserved. Um, they can have hypernatremia. So think of like everything, think of like a, a uh, what do you call it, like a can of soup, how they put a bunch of sodium in it to keep it still fresh. It's the same thing with this formula. So um, a lot of times what we have to do is dilute it by giving them more water, kind of think of flushing it out, um, but also doing regular sodium checks as well to make sure because um, sodium that's too high or too low can lead to serious complications. So what's my role as the nurse for a patient with enteral nutrition? I want to prevent aspiration by keeping the head of bed elevated and monitoring their lung sounds, uh, making sure that um, they're in an optimal position and not showing any signs of aspiration. Uh, maintaining tube patency. So I'm going to flush the tube with free water as ordered every four hours usually. I wanna verify their bowel sounds prior to anything because I'm giving this feeding in their abdomen, like in through their regular, um, we got route of absorption. So before that I'm going to feed this patient, I have to make sure that they have some sort of bowel sounds. If their bowel sounds are absent. I shouldn't be putting anything in their stomach because that could lead to an ileus 
or they could already have an alias and that could cause a bowel obstruction or worse than a bowel obstruction that's already there. Um, I need to monitor their nutrition status to see how is this working. So maybe monitoring those labs, the albumin, pre-albumin, checking on their energy or mood, checking on their weight to see how they are doing. I'm also going to verify medication safety. So if I'm giving medications through this tube, I want to make sure to use liquid medications when possible. Um, no extended release medications and crush them well. Because I definitely, you know, the purpose most of the time for this tube is not only to give meds, to give nutrition. So if I clog it with medications, I'm not going to be able to do either. So I want to make sure to keep this tube patent um, and be giving those medications safely. Now let's talk about parenteral nutrition. So this is um, nutrition that's given through an IV. <clears throat> so people get this if they have chronic and severe diarrhea or vomiting, they can't keep anything down or in their body, they're not absorbing enough. Um, obstruction, so like a patient with a bowel obstruction, again, we talked about if you have, don't have bowel sounds, you cannot receive enteral tube feedings. So this is a patient that if they had a bowel obstruction, this would be an option. Um, if they had some sort of GI abnormalities or a fistula, um, we may give them parenteral nutrition, a severe eating disorder or mal a malabsorption syst uh, syndrome. So some patients maybe with Crohn's or that have some really serious issues with absorbing nutrients may need this. Um, or if they have short bowel syndrome, which is really common in Crohn's um, because they, um, they get those that patchy inflammation, they have to cut out parts of the bowel and eventually there's just not enough bowel to absorb the nutrients that you need. So supplies that are needed are gonna be um, the bag of TPN, which is prepared by the pharmacy, special filter and tubing. Remember, we need to have that a filter at the end of the tubing in order to help because it's really big particles in the TPN. Um, we wanna have an IV pump. If we're giving actual TPN, I need a central line or a pick, but if I'm gonna give PPN, which is parenteral, uh, what did I say that? Uh, peripheral parenteral nutrition, I can talk, um, that's gonna be given through a peripheral IV. We want to prevent complications from, um, you know, giving TPN. So I want to monitor kidney and liver function. Remember, those are your filters. Um, and so a lot of times I'm giving a whole lot of nutrition at one point and it can kind of overload those filters. So I need to monitor the kidney and liver closely. Um, the patient can have hypo or hyperglycemia. So I definitely need to be watching their blood glucose check uh, uh, regularly every four to six hours. I'm going to be monitoring for hyperlipidemia um, by doing a regular lipid panel. Usually they do those every week on patients that are on <coughs> TPN. Um, I'm going to monitor for fluid overload. Legs and lungs are usually the places where I'm going to see fluid overload first. So monitoring for those signs. And then also monitoring for refeeding syndrome, um, which is going to be characterized by low phosphorus, low potassium, low magnesium, and fluid retention. Um, so looking and monitoring those electrolytes closely. So what's my role of the, as the nurse uh, for a patient that's receiving parenteral nutrition? I need to change the tubing, just like um, enteral nutrition, I need to change that tubing every 24 hours um, in the bag, that you get a new bag and new tubing every 24 hours. I do not want to add or mix anything with TPN. Nothing is compatible with TPN unless your pharmacist tells you otherwise. So it really needs to have its own dedicated line. Um, it should be tapered, not stop suddenly. And if you do have to stop it, or if you run out, you have to infuse D10 immediately, or they can have a serious blood glucose drop. Two nurses need to sign off on this medication in order to um, safely ad um, administer it. Um, they, so they have to kind of check to make sure all the ingredients are correct and what they're supposed to be. Like we talked about, I'm gonna check my blood glucose every four to six hours. And I'm gonna monitor for infection and IV complications. Cause remember the kind of access these are given in. So there's a lot of possible infections. Glucose, I'm um, oh, sorry, infection follows glucose. So if I have a whole bunch of sugar going into you through your bloodstream, you know, if there's any bacteria that's around, if I'm not keeping things clean, the bacteria are like, mm, yummy glucose. So you have to keep um, that um, site really clean and be changing that bag the, as often as you're supposed to and really just being super aseptic and careful with that um, access. So that's pretty much it. I hope this helped you to kind of start to get um, some of the basics of what enteral and parenteral nutrition is all about. See you next time.